everyone. My name is Kavita and I'm from IDP IELTS in Australia. I'm so excited to welcome you to our sixth event in our IELTS from start to finish series. We're happy to see so many test takers joining us from all over the world today. So thank you for connecting and choosing IELTS. Today, we welcome back IELTS expert Don Oliver, who will be running the webinar about common IELTS mistakes to avoid. So you can expect another amazing presentation today as Don will be sharing a lot of great tips and advice. As always, we will end the webinar with a short Q&A session. So if you're joining via Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And if you're joining us via Facebook, please leave any comments you have for Don in the comments box and we will try to answer as many as we can today. The Facebook recording of today's session will be available after this, so you can catch back on anything you may have missed or any resources that are mentioned that you want to refer back to. So without further ado, Don, welcome back. It's so nice to see you again after a little while. Yeah, thanks, Katie. It's lovely to see you too, as always. And it's really great to have uh, a lot of people tuning in today, and um, I hope that I can help them, Katie. Uh, as you said, uh, we're talking today about common IELTS mistakes and how to avoid them. Now, sometimes a, a test taker will do the test and they will be a little bit surprised that they did not do quite as well as they thought they would. And sometimes it's because maybe they weren't feeling very well that day. Maybe it's because there was a little bit of um, pressure in their life that stopped them performing well. But sometimes it's a matter of just making a few simple mistakes because they don't fully understand the test format and some of the things that are required by the test. So that's what we're looking at today. Let's see if we can help everybody understand what is really required in the IELTS test and how to avoid those simple mistakes. And we're going to look at the whole of the test. We're going to look at the mistakes that people sometimes make with listening and reading and more with speaking and especially with writing. So let's go through these mistakes one by one. Now, these are not in any particular order. Uh, they begin with listening and reading, and then they go to speaking. And finally, we'll talk about writing. Uh, but the first one is a very obvious one. And uh, when you are doing your listening test or your reading test, you have to write your answer. Uh, and there are two problems there. Sometimes uh, we make simple spelling mistakes. Now, if you make a spelling mistake on your mark sheet, in your paper and pencil test, or on the computer test, then that answer will be marked wrong. Even if it's clear what you meant. So, for example, if you don't write uh, a particular word with, um, if you write circle, for example, uh, with an S instead of a C, then that would be marked as wrong. The other thing that some people do is they think that their handwriting is really good, but it isn't. Sometimes people write and they think, oh, yeah, that's how you, you know, I've spelt that correctly but their O looks like an A, or their L looks like an E. Now, this is a problem because the marker will say it's not perfectly clear what this test taker intended. Therefore, I must mark this answer incorrect. I suggest that you print your answer. Use block letters. It doesn't matter about capital letters. All the letters can be capital. They can be block letters. And that will make it very clear uh, to the marker what you intend. So two very important things when you are doing the listening and the reading tip. 
Mistake number two. Sometimes when you're doing the listening or reading, you have your mark sheet there and maybe you've answered 35 questions of the 40. And there are five blank spot spaces at the end. And the invigilator says, you have one minute left. And you think, I don't know what the answers are. Guess. Don't leave any blank sp spaces. If it's a multiple choice question, write A, 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 because maybe you'll get two of those correct. If it's a true, false, not given, write true, 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 because maybe you'll get a couple of those correct. If you have to guess a word uh, or a number, guess it, because there are no uh, penalties for getting the wrong answer, but the penalty for not answering is clear. You will not get a score. The other thing that some people do is they think, well, it could be A or it could be B. I'm not sure. I'll write down A and B. Well, maybe the answer is A, but because you wrote down A and B, both are marked as wrong. If you are asked for only one answer, only give one answer. Because if you give two, then neither of them will be marked correct. Okay. Mistake number three. This is related to what I just said, but it's an important thing, especially in the paper and pencil test. In the paper and pencil test, your mark sheet uh, you have some time at the end of the listening to complete your mark sheet. And sometimes you are putting the answer on the question sheet in the listening and the reading. And then you're transferring your answer from the question sheet to the mark sheet. Right? I have seen some test takers transfer the answer from for question 21 into the space for question 22, and it, the rest follows. Now that's a big mistake because the marker must say, well, this is not the correct answer. And all of those will be marked as wrong. When you check your answers, also check for handwriting, also check for spelling, and a little bit of checking, and this goes for uh, writing as well, make sure that you have Put the right answer in the right spot. Okay, mistake number four. Now, here we say one mistake is not reading the listening question properly. What does that mean? Well, in the listening, you are given time to read the question. The recording will say, now you have some time to read the question, the questions for questions one to five, or questions 25 to 30, right? Some test takers fail to use that time well. Now, what do I mean? If you use your time well in reading the questions in listening, you will be doing these things. You'll take the full 20 seconds or 30 seconds to read the question. You will be looking for key words that you want to hear in the recording or a synonym for those words. You will be understanding the situation that they're talking about. You'll understand who is talking, where they are talking, what they are talking about. You will be able to maybe predict some of those answers. You'll be able to predict the type of word that you need to put in the answer. You'll be able to think of two questions at the same time. Because remember, in the listening test, you only hear the recording once. So if you miss that, first question, 
you've got to be ready to answer the next question. So having a couple of questions in your mind at the same time is a good strategy. If you miss one of them, you'll get to the next one. So that is what I mean by reading the listening question properly. And sometimes they will say answer in no more than one word or answer in no more than two words. So you know that you cannot write two words if they want only one word or three words if the question asks for only two words. That is reading the, the listening question properly. The similar thing is for the reading, but there are a few differences. You have plenty of time to read the reading question because it's up to you when you start reading the text. But I would always recommend that you read the questions before you look at the text. Quickly, look at the question because the question will sum up in some ways what the passage is about. And as with the listening, you should be able to find some key words in the question. What do they want to know about? Oh, they want to know about um, this country. They want to know about this disease or that machine. You should be able to predict some of the answers. You should be able to predict the type of word that you need to supply. You will also know how many words you are allowed to write because it will say answer in only one word or answer in up to two words, for example. And the other thing is with the answers that you write down for the reading, the word that you will write down is in the passage. So you should have no excuse for misspelling the word. They will say, complete this with a word from the passage. Not, not always, but in some questions, they will ask you to do that. So reading the, uh, reading the question properly in the reading test is an important skill. Okay. Mistake number six. Sometimes in the reading, people will try and read every word. They won't look at the questions first. They will start to read the passage and they will read every word. Now, each passage in the academic reading is about 900 words. That's about two and a half thousand words in total. You don't have time to read all those words, unless, of course, you are a very, very good reader. If you're a native speaker, you might do this because you can read quickly. But if English is your second language, then you need to try and read as efficiently as you can. That means to read as quickly as you can with comprehension. So don't try and read every single word. Practice skimming. And when you practice skimming, this is something you do in your own language, when you look at the newspaper, you don't read every word on the front page, do you? You find something that's interesting, not by reading every word, but by finding one or two words in it that look interesting. That is skimming. And then you'll be practicing scanning because you've looked at the questions and you've found some key words and you'll be looking for those key words. Sometimes you do need to read every word, but not always. If, for example, the question is quite hard, like true, false, and not given, and it's the answer is not given, and you can't see if it's true or false, you need to read every word then. But that's only sometimes, and it's not most of the time. We've had six mistakes so far, and we have. 13 to go. Now, this is, sounds like a very obvious thing. In speaking, people are not pronouncing their words correctly. Well, 
okay. Everybody knows that. It's hard to pronounce uh, the foreign language correctly. But you would be surprised that very many people whose first language is not English and whose first language has does not have some English sounds in it seem not to practice those sounds. I'll give you some examples. I worked in the Middle East for a long time. And if your first language is Arabic, you, do, you never say p, do you? You don't say p, you say b. You think, well, that all sounds the same. But it doesn't sound the same. Um, people and people are different. Now, this is an important thing if your first language is Arabic. And it's something that you can practice. You can learn how to make that p sound. If, for example, your first language is Korean, it's hard to say a word like lunch because you always want to put a, 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 a vowel at the end. You want to say lunchy, right? Because your language doesn't have what we call a consonant cluster at the end. You can practice it. If you, your first language is Vietnamese, it's very common for you to forget to say the ending of an English word, because this is not so important in your language. So if you say, if you're trying to say happened, and you say happen, then the examiner will think, well, that's a mistake in tense. You use the present tense instead of the past. But it was a pronunciation. So this is an important thing. Think about the problems that you have with pronunciation and practice. Because if you practice them, you will perfect English pronunciation you will be able to pronounce all the sounds of English. Okay, so do that. The other part of pronunciation, and this is a very common mistake, if you've seen the public version of the assessment criteria for speaking, and I hope you have, and if you haven't, please download it from um, um, IELTS.com or IELTS Essentials, our website. Look at the assessment criteria for pronunciation. And at a band eight, it says, this candidate uses a wide range of pronunciation features. Now, part of that is the sounds of English, right? P and B and A and E and all of that. But it is mostly about the intonation, the way your voice is used to express meaning. Intonation is one half of the mark for your pronunciation. The examiner wants to hear you speak naturally and expressively. So expressing meaning in English, and if you listen to my voice, you'll hear that some words are stress somewhere and you'll hear that my voice goes up when I'm trying to tell you something that's quite important and when I finish it goes down all of these are pronunciation features that the examiner is listening for so practice those practice intonation and that will help you get a high score in pronunciation and improve your speaking score we're halfway through. Mistake number nine. Now, in the speaking test, the examiner will ask you a question. And the question might be, well, uh, what, can you uh, tell me about um, the sorts of new movies that you like? And you answer, the sorts of movies that I like are. Now, if you continue to do this, to simply take the words that the examiner gives you and use them, 
You can do that sometimes. But if that's what you're doing all the time, then the examiner will think, well, this person does not have a very wide range of words. So practice using some different words. What sort of movies do you like? Well, I love lots of uh, types of movies. Um, that's a better answer. Uh, or, well, my favourite movie is. Here, you are giving the examiner a good reason to give you a good score for your lexical resource. That's one of the 25% of the mark. Your lexical resource is your vocabulary. Show the examiner that you have good vocabulary. Okay. Next common mistake is failing to extend your answers in the speaking. And an easy way to extend your answer in the speaking test is to always say why. What sports do you like? Well, I love football because I like team sports and I used to play football when I was at school. Give examples in the speaking test. What's your, what sports do you like? I like football because I played football at school and uh, I like team sports. Uh, for example, uh, other types of uh, team sports like uh, uh, hockey. I like them as well. Here, you are giving the examiner a re good reason to give you a good score because you can speak at length. And this is one of the assessment criteria. Are you willing to give more? And the more you give, the better. And on this subject, some test takers get worried when the examiner stops, when the examiner interrupts. They're speaking, 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 and the examiner says, and can I ask you another question? That's good. If the examiner interrupts you, that means you're doing well because you are giving a long answer and the examiner wants to get on to another question, wants to get on to a different topic. So don't, don't be worried about that. It's not being rude. It's actually a compliment to you if the examiner interrupts. Okay. This is a mistake that some people make, and it's such an obvious mistake. You don't want to do this. You're talking and you can't think of a word, right? And you say, uh, how you say, that's no good. That's bad English. Practice say, making a, a, a question like that uh, in perfect English. Uh, I'm not sure how I should describe this thing, but, or if you're asking the examiner to repeat something, don't say, say again. No, no, no. Say, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Would you say that again, please? This is good. This is an opportunity for you to actually give something that you have practiced, which is perfect, and which will tell the examiner that you have good grammar. So make sure that you practice a few phrases for asking the examiner to repeat, or asking the examiner to explain. I'm sorry, did you mean this or did you mean that? Or could you please explain that a little more? That's good. Mistake number 12. This is, a, a, this is such an important part of the speaking. You know in part two of the speaking, you have to speak for two minutes. And you have to speak about a simple topic. So some people think, well, that's easy. I can talk about 
a famous person, or I can talk about a place where I like to go to, or I can talk about a useful uh, piece of equipment that I sometimes use. But for two minutes, it's quite difficult. And especially if there are any native English speakers listening now, especially for you, it's a very wise thing to practice making good notes before you speak. You're given one minute to make notes. Now, if you practice making good notes, that will make the part two much easier. And good notes are not an essay, not sentences. It's maybe 10 words. Where this came who I was with, what I did, um, when, um, how I felt, etc. If you do that, and you've written down 10 words, you could speak for five minutes. You could speak for 10 minutes about those. About each of those words, you could speak for 30 seconds. So do that. Practice making good notes at the beginning of your part two. And the other thing is you will be much more relaxed about part two. And if you look at the assessment criteria, or the speaking, the first criterion is fluency and coherence. And one of the very important elements in that is how much effort it, you need to produce language. If you're able to produce it with not much effort, if you're able to do it in a relaxed way, you will get a higher score for your fluency. Okay. Let's go on to mistake number 13. Now, remember we had not reading the listening question uh, properly, not reading the reading question properly, and now we have not reading the writing question properly. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that anyone makes. Task one, if you're doing general training, task one, some people misunderstand the purpose of the letter. This is a very important thing. You need to understand why you are writing this letter in general training task one. You need to know who you're writing to and what the three points are that you should address. In academic task one, sometimes people do not read or understand the task very well. They don't have practice, they haven't practiced looking at graphs, they haven't practiced looking at a table of figures, they haven't practiced looking at maps. These are all task one uh, tasks. Do that and make sure you spend at least two or three minutes understanding what the task is in writing. In task two, there are sometimes some, an easy question, to what extent do you agree? That's easy. Sometimes there is a difficult question. What are the reasons for this? And do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? That's a more difficult question. Discuss both you and give your own opinion. That's a difficult question. Spend a couple of minutes understanding the question so that you are able to fully answer. That's what you have to do in the writing. And many people forget to do that. Let's continue. Mistake number 14. In writing, the second assessment criterion <clears throat> is coherence and cohesion. It's 25% of the mark. What does it mean? It means that what you have written is well organized. It means it is logically organized. It means it begins with an introduction, it continues with a, a, a topic, addressing a topic in one paragraph, going on to another um, 
element of that topic or a different topic in the next paragraph, finally concluding. When we do this, we have to use paragraphs to help the reader, to show the reader that yes, our introduction has finished. And now I'm going to talk about this. And next I'm going to talk about that. Topic. And finally, I am going to sum up what I've said. Paragraphs are an important part of writing because without them, the reader will be a little bit confused. The paragraphs are not difficult, really. When you think, okay, I finished that thought, now I'm going to have another thought, start a new paragraph. And remember, paragraphs are important in general training, letters, task one, also important in academic task one, and also in task two for both uh, general training and academic. So whenever you write, write in paragraph. And by the way, while we're talking about this, make sure they are full paragraph. In other words, don't put dot points in there. Don't put numbered lists in there. Don't use subheadings. Don't do that. We want full sentences, full paragraph. Okay. The next mistake that some people make is using the incorrect format in writing. And really, I've just talked about that. Format is different to what I was talking about uh, in terms of paragraph. Format is those things I just mentioned about bullet points, numbered lists, subheadings. You must use full sentences and full paragraphs when you write an IELTS essay. And I know in some disciplines at university, using bullet points is okay. Using numbered lists is okay. Using subheadings is okay. In some disciplines, but not all. Make sure, though, that in the IELTS writing, it's always full sentences and full paragraphs. We're nearly at the end of this and we're going to have finish with a beautiful little video that sums up a lot of the writing tips that I'm giving you and adds a couple more. But uh, here, this mistake number 17 is maybe one of the most uh, common uh, problems with writing. And this is not addressing the question fully. Now, I've already talked about this to some extent, but let me expand it. In task one writing, you need to be able to give the main features, not every feature, and you need to be able to supply an overview, which is a general statement of the main features. This is describing the graph or the table of figures or the diagram fully. So don't forget to include the key features. Don't forget to include an overview in academic task one. In general training task one, don't forget to include all of the bullet points that you are asked to uh, address in the task. If you leave out one, you will only get a band four for that first criteria. In task two, it's equally important to find out, to work out for yourself, how many things do I have to cover? Do I have to discuss both views? Or can I just discuss one view? Do I have to give one solution? Or do I have to give several solutions? Do I have to agree or disagree? Do I have to simply discuss? Do I have to weigh the two uh, possibilities and see if one is more important than the other? 
or if there are more advantages than disadvantages, you must read the question very carefully in order to address the question fully. Mistake number 18, presenting an unclear position. Now, this is something that happens a lot in task two writing. In task two writing, one of the assessment criteria is that a position is presented. That is clear. What does it mean? Well, a position means what you think. Don't say there are many sides to this question. Don't say this is a big problem without saying what you think. I think, I believe, in my opinion, use these words in your task two essay because that is what the examiner is looking for. Phew, we have only one more uh, mistake to look at and then our video. And this really applies to all the written uh, parts of the written test, reading, listening, but especially with writing. You should spend a couple of minutes looking at the question at the beginning and quickly making a plan and spend a couple of minutes at the end checking for spelling errors and grammatical errors, the sorts of errors that you often make, articles, maybe, tenses, maybe, prepositions, maybe, and especially if you are doing the computer delivered test, there may well be typographical errors, typos. With your fat fingers, sometimes you don't write T-H-E and you write T-E instead of the. This is a simple mistake. I do it all the time. Therefore, it's important to check your work, especially if it is the computer delivered IELTS. You're spending a little bit of time doing that, you'll find that it may increase your score by half a band. Okay, we're going to now look at our beautiful video, which I promised you. Hey, IELTS test. There we are. Now I'm going to pause it very quickly. That's good. Because I just want to introduce it. Now, this is uh, a video that uh, we produced. IDP, and it's one of many videos that are available to you if you go to um, our YouTube channel. So this sums up what you need to do if you want to avoid similar mistakes in the writing, okay? In writing task two. Let's listen to it. Hey, IELTS test takers. We're here today to tell you about seven mistakes that could be preventing you from scoring a band seven or higher in IELTS Writing Task 2. You're welcome to pause the video and read as we move through the essay example. Test takers sometimes wonder why they scored the way they did in the IELTS Writing Test and become frustrated with their writing band score. We are going to show you seven mistakes that test takers make that prevent a higher band score. We will also show you the features that the examiner looks at when assessing your essay and deciding the band score. Let's fix this essay and turn it from a band five into a band seven. Mistake number one, not enough paragraphs. This is a very easy mistake to make, but it's very costly. Look at what the band descriptors say. In this essay, there are only two paragraphs one very long one with a number of ideas, and a one-sentence concluding paragraph. Solution. Fix paragraphing and make the one-sentence paragraph into two sentences. Mistake number two. Incorrect format. Task two essays must be written in essay format using paragraphs to show your introduction, body paragraphs and conclusion. This is an easy mistake to make if you are rushing. Look at what the band descriptors say. Solution, remove the numbers. Mistake number three, partially addressing the question. Take time
time to read the question carefully and decide how many parts are in the question. For this three-part question, you need to discuss both views and give your own opinion. This is a three-part question, but they only agreed that wild animals should not be in zoos. They did not give you any reason why animals should be kept in zoos. They only addressed two parts of the question and their opinion is not very clear or supported. Solution. Include the other viewpoint. There are good reasons for having zoos and make your opinion clearer. Mistake number four, presenting an unclear position. According to the band descriptors for task response, the writer of this task would have received a band four. To receive a better mark, you need to decide on your position and maintain it throughout the response. Solution. Make sure that the examiner knows what you are thinking. Mistake 5. Spelling errors and typos. Have a look at the band 5, 6 and 7 criteria for lexical resource. The writer of this task would have scored between a band 5 and a band 6. To have improved their score, they needed to spell correctly. Remember that a typo is a spelling error. Remember computer-delivered IELTS does not have a spell check function. Before your IELTS, you should practice commonly misspelled words. For example, Solution. Correct your spelling and typos. Mistake 6. Using inappropriate memorised language, phrases and clichés. When they're marking your writing task, the examiner is looking for memorised language, so don't use it. Memorised language is easy to identify, so use your own words and avoid overused phrases like these. Solution. Remove memorised language and use your own words to express your ideas clearly. Mistake 7. Using surveys and research to support your opinion. For our final step, you need to use real examples and evidence from your own life experience. Examiners cannot check if your research and survey examples are real. They do not support your response appropriately. Solution. Remove the false research and include your own examples. With that final mistake fixed, let's take a look at our transformed Band 7 essay. Thanks for watching. We hope you have learned something about the IELTS writing task too. Avoid these seven mistakes and you'll be on your way to a Band 7 result for writing task two. Okay, so wasn't that interesting? Um, and it really summed up a lot of the things that I, we were talking about uh, earlier on. So what I'd like to finish with now before we get the, to the questions is to just remind you that uh, you can find a lot of help from us uh, at our website, official website. Uh, go to our Facebook page. You can ask questions there and read the answers to uh, questions that have already been asked. Uh, you can learn a few things on uh, TikTok and um, all sorts of other things that I'm too old to really be into. So um, there is, uh, I must actually remind you, there is another bonus YouTube uh, webinar on next week uh, and uh, there'll be more information about that later on. Okay, so um, KD, we're ready for questions. What have you got for me? Yes, thank you, Don. <laughs> Um, first of all, just wanted to say, as always, another amazing presentation. So many amazing tips. So let's get to the questions now. We've got some around writing. So someone asked, should we type or write answers in capital letters? Um, it's, it, it's up to you. Um, if your writing is clear, uh, write as you like. Um, if you find writing in capital letters is, is too slow, well, don't do it, but there is no penalty. If you write all of your um, uh, writing in uh, essays, in the writing test in capitals, fine. 
If you write your answers in the reading and the listening in capitals, fine, okay? Great, thanks for that. And does this also apply for cursive handwriting? Uh, you can write uh, with uh, running writing, cursive writing is not a problem, but make sure it is clear, okay? That's all. Oh, good. Thank you for that. Next question is about word limit. So someone asked, what if I exceed the word limit? Will I lose marks? Uh, in the writing test, the wo those word limits, 150 words for task one and 250 words for task two are minimums. Uh, there is no maximum. You could write 300 words for task one and 500 words for task two, but I recommend that you do not because if you write so many words, then you can make many more mistakes and probably your essay will lose its focus uh, and you won't have time to check your work. Now, some candidates do this. They think more is better. That's not true. Uh, I would recommend something like 170 words for task one and maybe 270 words for task two. Brilliant, thank you for that. Um, someone else asked, what should I take into consideration when aiming for a band seven score? Well, the first thing you should do is look at the assessment criteria for speaking and writing, which you can find on our website. And it's quite clear what you need to do in the four criteria for both speaking and writing to get a band seven. But speaking generally, to sum it up, a band six can make quite a few spelling errors and quite a few grammatical errors, but we still understand what the, the person means. At a band seven, there are far fewer spelling mistakes, far fewer grammatical errors. At band eight and nine, hardly any. So if you're making maybe um, 10 spelling mistakes in your writing, you won't get a band seven for lexical resource for that criteria. If you're making 10 grammatical errors, you won't get a seven for your uh, grammatical range and activity, okay? Good tip, Don. Um, another question from someone asking about the speaking test. Um, what do I do if I don't know much about the topic? Yeah, that's a, first of all, all of the topics are already uh, trialed with people, with many people, to find out if they are accessible. We will never ask a question about politics, never ask a question about religion. Uh, so those sorts of questions are out. But the sorts of things that an educated person talks about, like education or health or city planning or the environment, all of these things you sh are expected to be able to talk about. And remember, you don't have to be an expert. You can speak very fluently and very well about how you don't know anything about something. For example, what should the government do to uh, improve the um, air quality in your city? Well, I'm not a scientist and uh, I really don't know, but I imagine that um, you might be able to stop cars and industry uh, emitting gases. That's a fine answer. You don't need to actually give an expert answer. Great advice, Don. A um, few people have asked for some practical tips about speaking and improving their vocabulary. What's your advice, Don? Uh, improving vocabulary, I think, is critical for every part of the test. The more words you know, the easier the listening will be. The more words you know, the easier the reading will be. The better your speaking will be, the better your writing will be. Now, how do you learn words? Everyone who's listening to me has learned a lot of words because they're understanding what I'm saying. But I would recommend you also try and learn phrases and learning words that are related to each other. So if you find a good word, for example, uh, vicinity. Now, this is a, not, not such a common word. It means in the neighborhood. 
when I use the word vicinity, I say in the vicinity of. Now I've learned four words there. I've learned a preposition and another preposition, in and of, and I've learned that we use the definite article, the. Now this is very helpful because not only have I learned a word, I've learned some good grammar with it. So when I use that word in my essay or in my speaking test, the examiner will say tick for lexical resource, tick for grammar. So that's what I would suggest. Thank you, Don. And uh, we've got another speaking question. Um, for question one in the speaking module, can I use words like, you know, yeah, yep, like we usually do when having a conversation? Uh, yes, you can. Um, if the speaking test is a little formal, um, because it's a test, but it's not very formal. And basically, the sort of interaction that you are having with the examiner is a very relaxed one. Um, leave it at yeah and uh, you know. Don't go into some, uh, don't uh, use swear, swear words or anything like that. It's not that informal. You're not talking to your friend at the pub. Uh, so maintain a sort of formality. But if you say, yeah, you know, that's fine. Not a problem. Perfect. On that note, um, we also had another question about hand movements. So does it matter if uh, they make hand movements during the speaking test? Um, it, it doesn't matter at all. Um, if some people speak with their hands, some people do not. Uh, there is no assessment of body language, okay? So even if you are, um, are looking the other way, uh, that is not assessed. So, um, but remember, the examiner wants you to succeed and wants you to be relaxed. So relax. Um, share eye contact with the examiner, smile, um, use your hands if you want to, not a problem. Good to know. So um, another question from someone here, um, how does one practice intonation? Like, do you have any tips, Don? Yeah, um, there are lots of techniques for doing this. Imitation uh, is an important thing. Uh, and there is a, a technique called shadowing, where you listen to something, and you say it as the person says it. Of course, you uh, need to listen a, a lot so that you know what's coming next and you sort of rehearsing a sort of a script almost. Some people recommend you do this while you walk because the walking and the movement and the rhythm of that can help you uh, have a good rhythm when you speak. And rhythm is a part of um, the assessment in the speaking test. It's a pronunciation feature. So if you're able to maintain a, uh, a natural rhythm, if you're able to show that you uh, are able to produce natural intonation, and remember intonation is all about conveying meaning. So uh, it, 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 it's when you, when you stress something, that is a word that should be stressed. Uh, you wouldn't stress a, you know, ah, you would stress a dog, right? So you you have to be careful about that. But that's where imitation comes. In. So you imitate na native speakers um, who are talking about something you're interested in and imitate again and again and again. And frankly, it's the easiest thing in the world now with YouTube. So make take advantage of it. Thanks, Don. Another one in speaking part two. If I don't cover all the questions on the cue card, uh, although I've spoken for the full two minutes, is that okay? That's okay. Uh, in writing, you have to answer the question fully. In speaking, you do not. Speaking assessment does not have that criterion in it. Uh, the examiner will make a different assessment of your writing compared to your speaking. And that is because uh, the, in speaking, the examiner is in control and they can tell you, well, no, I, I want, actually want you to answer that question, not this question. So 
um, in, the, in part two, those points that are given to you are a suggestion only. If you want to look at only one of them, if you want to look at, in fact, none of them, that's okay. The assessment is made on the quality of your speech. But finally, Katie, I would say, if the task is please des uh, describe uh, uh, some equipment that you find useful, mm -hmm. don't talk about dinosaurs because you love dinosaurs because then the examiner will say, well, first of all, maybe they don't understand the word equipment so their lexical resource is not good, or maybe they've rehearsed this, so I will just ignore them. Okay. Well, that, that brings me to the next question. Um, someone asked, can I use personal examples in my writing and speaking test? Yes, um, you should, um, always. Um, in the writing, you're asked to express a position and to support it with your uh, evidence from your own experience. You are told that. Uh, so if you're talking about uh, the effects of pollution, for example, you can say where I live, the pollution is quite good, uh, quite bad. Um, for, for example, you know, I, I have to boil the water. Um, in speaking, uh, using your own uh, experience is fine, especially in part one, because that is the focus. What do you like to do? What do you wear? What food do you like, etc. In part three of the speaking mode, the examiner will move you from the personal onto the general. So you, the examiner might ask a question like, well, um, you know, uh, is, the is the education, uh, primary education in your country effective? And you will start by saying, well, my experience with primary education the examiner will let you speak, but then the examiner will say, well, did most people have this experience in your country? In other words, the examiner wants you to then speak generally. And that is the focus of part three of the speaking. Okay. Yeah, cool. That's great. Another question from a test taker. How can I improve my academic vocabulary for writing tasks? Most of the newspapers and magazine articles are not ideal. So any suggestions, Don? Uh, yeah, there are. The academic writing is not very academic. Uh, it's called academic writing, but really the assessment is in lexical resource um, is basically, are you able to use words naturally? Are you able to use less common words, not necessarily technical words? Um, uh, and are you able to use idiomatic language? Okay. Idiomatic language means really just combinations of words that are natural in a native speaker. Um, if you read academic papers, and I have read a lot of academic papers, you'll find the actual writing is very poor most of the time. It's not very clear. So don't use um, an academic paper as a model for an IELTS essay. Uh, a better model would be something like uh, a, an opinion piece in a newspaper, um, someone expressing an opinion in a news magazine, and if you really want good examples of those things, you go to newspapers like The Guardian or to English language newspapers in your own country or um, online, look at The Economist or New Scientist and things like that. That is perfectly good, um, perfectly good vocabulary for a write, writing task too. Um, thanks, Don. Someone wanted your opinion. Um, I haven't taken the IELTS test yet. Is it better to try one first without any preparation to understand what I need to work on? Uh, it's expensive. <laughs> I, would, I would suggest it's cheaper uh, to actually look at a few practice tests. From I mean, You can buy a practice test book uh, for about, I don't know, in Australia, probably about $30. Uh, as opposed to 300 and something dollars for the actual test. But KD, as you know, we have the progress check, yes. uh, which is a very useful um, uh, way mm. of assessing whether you are ready to do the actual test. And that's much cheaper 
than the real test. And you can find details of that on KD. IELTS.com.au or IELTS Essentials. Very good. So um, one, well, we're, down, we're running out of time. So I'll ask my last two questions. Um, so uh, one comes from a test taker who wants to know, because um, uh, a teacher told um, uh, this test taker that sh they should use synonyms uh, to avoid repetition like realm for area, but it looks awkward to write rural realm. So what are your thoughts, Don? Yeah. Uh, that's a, this is, it goes back to what I said about learning vocabulary. If you learn one word like realm uh, and you learn another word like rural um, and you try and put them together, uh, it doesn't work because no one ever puts those words together. Um, but if you do learn the word rural um, uh, and you learn it in a sentence, you might find that you can join that word to rural area or uh, rural industry or um, rural uh, lifestyle. Um, so that is an important thing, learning words in combinations. Um, the question that uh, you, you, the idea you began with was that we should use synonyms. Well, that's true, uh, but you should have more than one way of talking about uh, a thing. But in English, the word realm, the word area, the word territory, uh, the word vis um, vicinity, uh, all of those have slightly different meaning. And that's why you have to learn the adjective that goes with the noun, the adverb that goes with the adjective, the preposition which goes before the noun, if there is one, etc. One last question, Don, before we wrap up. So besides um, the speaking test, is it possible to use idioms in the writing task too? Yes, but be careful of idioms because uh, idioms cover a wide range of things. Uh, idioms can be phrasal verbs, like what did you get up to on the weekend? Get up to on the weekend. Uh, that's a normal way of speaking. It is idiomatic though, because we can combine those words to create a new meaning. There are other idioms like uh, there's not enough room to swing a cat here. Well, don't use those because first of all, they are too um, idiomatic. They are too, they are not formal enough and you are likely to misuse them because you can only use a, a lot of those idioms in a particular context. And some of them you can only use in the negative and you'll try and use it in the positive um, and all sorts of complications. So stick to phrasal verbs, understand how they're used and that is idiomatic enough for you. That's great. Thanks so much, Don. Well, that wraps up our session for this evening. So thank you all for joining us for today's uh, webinar. We truly appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who joined us and asked a question. If we didn't get the chance to answer your question, make sure to message us um, and we will answer it. So have a great day, everyone. Okay, thank you everyone. And thank you, KD. See you later. <laughs>